get going with uh, with Holly and the uh, updates. Excellent. Okay, uh, I just wanna make sure, good. I think I have things set. Um, Great. So operational updates for uh, for the last month. Obviously, we had a big month last month. It was the month of DrupalCon, um, and lots of great things happen in Austin. And even though that was just last month, I'm pretty sure everyone here could tell you that it feels like it was maybe 18 months, two years ago that Austin happened. <laughs> Um, but it was a really, it was a really good show for the association and um, and for the community in a number of ways. Um, lots of great um, attendance, obviously. Um, but I think in particular, we were really excited about some of the ways that we we're able to leverage DrupalCon and folks being together to um, drive forward some continued momentum on Drupal.org in particular. So having Whitney Hess there to kick off the user research project, to meet with the working groups, to have actual face-to-face -face, uh, interviews with folks was really great. Um, you know, we've continued to carry that forward past Austin. Um, just getting the working groups uh, together to start to think about a short-term vision for Drupal.org was really uh, empowering. Um, so, so those were really great. Um, and then, we're also really excited about the sprints that happened. Um, you know, although we were not able to remove all the Drupal project beta blockers, and in fact, maybe increase them that day uh, of the Friday sprints, we were able to uh, get over 30 community contributions to Drupal.org that we've been able to commit in the week since DrupalCon Austin. So lots of great stuff for Drupal.org that happened out of Austin on top of, you know, all of the wonderful community building and learning that goes on there um, as well. So uh, that's, you know, we've really been focused on the cleanup uh, from DrupalCon and, and getting um, our, you know, invoices paid so we can close the finances, um, going through the issues that were addressed uh, in the uh, in these sprints, et cetera. So just closing down DrupalCon has really been the focus um, in, in June uh, so that we can gear up and get ready for, for Amsterdam. Um, and I think uh, just, you know, one other note about the, um, the numbers overall uh, that I just want to talk about as we look at some of those numbers is that we have a ton of numbers that are tied to the idea that we would have a Drupal 8 release in 20, 2014. And um, since that's been pushed out, uh, you know, those numbers are just not going to hit goal. Uh, so we just want to say that out loud so we're clear about that. <laughs> but um, we still think they're the right numbers to be to be looking at, and they're good to track. And we're really glad that we have the numbers on a monthly basis going forward. Um, we're just there's a number of goals we're not going to hit, and we'll talk about some of those. We go through them, um, and then I just think the last thing I really want to highlight again is that we've had a ton of momentum on the Drupal.org um, uh, project overall. And I think particularly around infrastructure, so um, Rudy, um, his new team member, Archie, um, the, the infrastructure working group and the infrastructure team have done a ton of great work. Um, we now have a CDN up and deployed um, in front of all of Drupal.org, which is really fantastic. It lessens the burden on our resources at OSU OSL, and um, it will hopefully increase the page, page load time uh, particularly outside of the U.S. Um, where things get really pokey. Um, so we are excited to uh, have that up and are obviously tracking the numbers related to that so we can see um, what kind of impor uh, performance improvement it has had. <clears throat> so lots of good stuff um, coming out of Drupal.org in June, which is really great. So um, one other caveat about the numbers as we look at some of them is just that uh, we, to prepare for a July 9th board meeting, we were unable, you know, we had to produce materials about a week ahead of time for the board, uh, which meant we could not close the financials in time to have the financial numbers updated in the dashboard. Uh, it just wasn't going to happen by July 2nd or 3rd. Uh, so anywhere we look in the KPIs um, right now and we see dollar amounts, those are just, those are last month's numbers. Um, so we're just not going to comment on them for this month. Just that's where they sat last month and we didn't update them for this month. Any questions about that? See a question over here. Okay, great. Uh, and looks like Donna and Denise have joined. All right. <laughs> so, so we can't really look at some of the financials right now. Um, but, uh, in terms of our overall KPIs, um, again, things are looking really well for us in a number of areas, particularly around program work. 
Um, lots of program participants, obviously, with Austin. We've had some great um, webcast numbers lately, uh, people joining webcasts. Um, so I think our, our last one had uh, over 100 people on it. Uh, we've been hitting those numbers pretty regularly now, which is great. Um, membership is also um, doing really well. Liz and Joe have been um, creating some really cool uh, promotions and experiments to see what excites people to join and renew. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. But those numbers look really great, um, with the exception of our slider experiment, which we <laughs> implemented um, last year sometime. We got that slider going up in the fall. Um, and it continues to be drugged down instead of you know, being drug up overall. Um, so we may want to consider uh, a different way of presenting the pricing for memberships uh, in the future. Um, although it's not affecting the budget negatively, because um, the number, numbers overall have been fine, um, it is, it is you know, we're having people join at less than the suggested amount overall. So I, I have a... Oh, go yeah. ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. This is Jeff. Um, can we can we have Josh work on a mechanism where if somebody brings a slider down, it changes their headshot to a Scrooge McDuck? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get right on that, Jeff. <laughs> Never change. It's a really important board uh, board observation. I just had to get in right before Matthew spoke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Matthew, did you have a question? I, I, I don't have really have a question, but I have perhaps a suggestion um, of how maybe maybe we could tweak things and uh, and try them a little bit differently. Um, as as folks might know, um, we're going into Drupal Camp Colorado uh, next month, uh, the first first of the month, and this year we we uh, we set things up so it was entirely free. Um, however, people could uh, could uh, decide what they wanted to pay for the uh, for the camp. And anything that we get above our budget goal is going to go to uh, a few, a few different, uh, a few different um, um, nonprofits. Um, and what we did was we set um, uh, the sort of the sort of default at the amount where you would get a T-shirt, and uh, and uh, and just to just to see what would happen. And it's not a slider; it's just an open text box. Um, and I would say that looking at the numbers at this point. By and large, the vast majority of people have chosen to put in more money than than the default T-shirt uh, amount. Um, we've got a few people that have put in zero, but very, very few. Um, maybe maybe it's the presentation. Maybe it's because people can slide things easily, and maybe yeah. if there were a default number there that uh, that they that they felt like uh, you know it was uh, maybe maybe it's just a presentation. Yeah. No, I think I think that's a you know a good observation, and it pro that's that's probably right. Um, we haven't really prioritized um, re-engineering that or putting resources into re you know reconfiguring how that displays for folks um, because it hasn't had a budget impact yet. Um, but uh, but I think yeah, there are lots of ways that we can display the membership options uh, and payment options for folks. Uh, you know, price points. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll certainly do some testing with those. Uh, so let's see. So memberships, um, also uh, camp fiscal sponsorship. Just to to let you know, we had a goal of serving twenty camps this year. We're up to twenty seven, which is which is great. Um, and it's the the team here, uh, both on the finance side, you know, Chris and Leslie, um, and the community uh, management position, Lauren. They've spent some time thinking about that program and how to better document and, um, you know, make, make that market that program essentially, um, including pos a possible renaming of it because um, fiscal sponsorship is both um, incredibly boring and confusing as a term. Uh, so, so we're thinking about that, um, but that continues to be a really, you know, popular service. We're glad folks are taking advantage of that and um, the, the grants and scholarships, all that good stuff. Um, and then here's where we definitely hit some numbers that are uh, sub uh, subpar because again we've got some they're they're heavily reliant on the um, the Drupal eight release um, so we've got um, under our banner of growing Drupal adoption you know number of Drupal sites contributors um, D.O. site traffic those are things that are definitely driven by a release cycle. 
Um, and they're not in the red, but they're not in the green either, right? So some numbers there, but other things look good overall. So on the whole, um, things look good for us. Um, Drupal cons, again, we've got this red for dollars, uh, but you have to ignore that for this month because it's not updated. But um, the numbers look really great for Drupal cons. We were able to finally get some audience information back. We said we wanted to get to more evaluators and site owners overall, and on the whole, we're doing that. Um, but most importantly, we're capturing sort of baseline numbers for who our audience is in a discreet, measurable way for the first time, which we're pretty excited about. Um, so those numbers were good for us. Um, and the one other thing that we uh, we calculated that we have now for Austin is the net promoter score, uh, which is 23. Um, it's tough to say if that's good or bad because it's something you measure against yourself, and it's the first time we've measured for the cons, uh, but we, we asked that net promoter question, how likely are you to recommend DrupalCon to another you know, community member, give them a scale of one to 10, 10 being, I would tell them to come this very second, and one being never in a million years. Your nines and tens are your promoters, um, sixes and belows are your detractors, um, and you know, now we know. <laughs> We've got some numbers, um, but I think they look pretty solid to us, and we, I, was, I was happy to see the numbers where they were at. I believe it's actually designed such that you can actually compare it to others, so you can benchmark yourself. Yes, if you can find other people in the same, doing, using the Net Promoter Score for the same kind of work. Correct. Yeah. We can't, we can't benchmark ourselves against, you know, Pepsi the brand. Hey, Holly, I don't know anything about this um, thing, so 30 is like a perfect, or like, what is 23? Like if we were measuring this on a hundred or a, you know base ten scale, would thirty be like an eighty percent? So twenty three is like a sixty percent, or like how does it work? So if all of your respondents gave you nines or tens, right, then you would have a score of a hundred. Because what you do is you take the number of people who gave you nines or tens, and you subtract the number of people who gave you six or below, right, and that gives you a score. Um, and so it's possible to get a perfect score, <laughs> but that like that's never going to happen, right? Um, so I can send out a little bit more reading about this. Again, I think it's mostly going to matter as we look at it from a trend line from con to con. Right, but that's a twenty-three out of a hundred is how we should read that. Um, yes, with the understanding that no one's going to ever get a hundred. Right, like that's just. It, it can easily look up some more details on this. Um, yeah. Like it's a well-established method of measuring customer satisfaction. The internet has many words about it. Yeah, it's it's sort of the the way every organization measures, or not everyone, but all, most organizations measure their customer satisfaction that way. Yeah. Um, and then we're still bringing in numbers on the code sprint contributions, just so you know, we, we were able to count a small subset of um, commits, but we're working with um, some of the folks who run the sprints to figure out how to better track that number. But that's our, our initial take is we've got 81 commits that happened the week of DrupalCon. Um, you know, obviously lots of folks commit, um, uh, wrote patches during the sprint that have yet to be committed, so we haven't counted those yet. So that's be, uh, you know a good baseline look at Austin. Um, Amsterdam is underway. The early bird deadline is this week. Um, all the numbers are on track for Amsterdam so far. Um, and obviously, um, was it is Friday this right? Am I saying Friday is the deadline? Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So Friday, um, Thursday and Friday, but Friday in particular are going to be big days, and we'll we'll watch those and know if we're going to hit our goals there. But again, we had a ton of sessions submitted for Amsterdam, 510 compared to 350 something for Prague. So um, you know, we see a lot of interest in Amsterdam and expect that to do really well. Um, you know, we've just really been working on the numbers there with Amsterdam to make it worth both, both, both budget-wise and space-wise. Uh, but uh, I think the team's put a really good plan in place. So um, Latin America also moving forward. Um, so we should have a site up for that with more information in August mid-August and um, you know have been working with the team um, on all the planning there. Um, Steph Torres just got back from Bogota. Must have been exciting to be there during World Cup season. Um, and 
I think that the big thing there just to, to point out is that, you know, we are we are working on both figuring out what the um, what the translation services or the language preference is going to be for that event, uh, whether we'll run it in English and offer translation into Spanish uh, or vice versa. Um, so but we're working with the team to sort of figure that out. But we will have translation services available one way or the other so that, um, you know, you, you can get the content in either English or Spanish um, on the budget side. Um, you know, we're shooting for a net uh, neutral budget, so, you know, no profit or loss. Um, and <laughs> I've been working really hard to understand what the cost really will be for, for that event. Um, so we'll, you'll see more of that finalized in the 2015 um, budget presentation later this year. Any con questions? Okay, so I said a ton of words about Drupal.org already. <laughs> um, lots of great stuff going on there. Um, and I think lots of the metrics that are in red, those are metrics related to uh, Drupal 8 release by and large. But do you guys have any other things you want to cover on the Drupal.org side? Okay. I guess, I mean, astronomically big jumps in those numbers would be related to Drupal 8, but I think you know, given all the great work that's happening with Drupal.org, we should still see those numbers increasing month that, over month. Yeah, that's um, right. As we improve the issue queues, for example, right, like we would expect that that would affect the contributors number, right? If it's easier to use the issue queues, exactly. contributors would go up, but they wouldn't go up by the amounts we had thought based on a Drupal 8 release in the same year. Correct. So given that we're not going to have a Drupal 8 release this year, barring an active deity, um, should we just readjust our targets for the rest of the year so that they're achievable? But, you know, we don't have to ignore the, because what I'm worried about is it's fine to ignore them because they're against astronomically unachievable targets right now, mm -hmm. but there's still a chance that all of the work that we're doing on Drupal.org isn't actually impacting the way we need it to. And I don't want that to get lost against, well, we're never going to hit 24,000. So let's not worry about it. You know what I mean? So, um, right. That is a good thought. Um, that is a good thought. I'm most of the time I'm like, I'm a don't, don't, you know, we set a measure, let's continue to measure against it and just understand what assumptions failed. Um, but I hear what you're saying about not wanting to lose track of whether or not the small changes we're making now are, are having an impact. Um, the problem I think Angie is that um, for any, to understand that we would have to understand the data um, we would have to have access to better data than we have for what's happened previously, right? So all we have for things like contributors, right? Um, uh, for example, um, is an aggregate number for an entire year, right? We, we aren't really able to break the numbers down um, more in a more granular way than that um, for, for previous years. So it'd be hard to say if we're pushing it up or down. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, maybe I could get with Neil or, or Josh then, because we can totally break those numbers down by monthly aggregates. Or, I mean, it's all in the database, so we would be able to do that. I guess it's a question if I'm the only one who has that concern. I just don't want to get to the end of the year and then find out we just invested $300,000 or whatever it was in Drupal.org, and our contribution numbers went up by 1%. Okay. You know what I mean? like, that's, my, that's... Yeah. my understanding of the way the data is structured is that um, the that number is only like once if you haven't captured it in an ongoing monthly way, that number keeps getting rewritten yeah. in the database. Okay. So, so, but we can look at that um, if the board feels like it's worth reinvestigating these goals or resetting them. Yeah. And I might just be an oddball, so that's fine. By the way, um, Donna can't talk, so she asked if you could take her off. Oh, sorry. Uh, I will go look at that. Is uh, is Angie an oddball? Um, I, I don't think that we necessarily need to reset our original our original goals, but it would be really good for us to at least think about um, what we believe is achievable, given the uh, the fact that we're not we're not uh, uh, we're not going to have a Drupal eight release um, this year, and and uh, and just use that as a as a as a metric as a as a lens rather. Um, to to how the numbers are are, uh, are are lining up, I'd like to know whether we're doing better. Um, but I, I tend to agree that once once goals are set, we should probably we should probably stick with those goals, um, even though we know that uh, that that they're not achievable. 
might be useful to <coughs> in you know one of the future board meetings to talk a little bit more about you know this problem and what we think the cause of the problem is and how we prioritize things relative to overcoming that. So we have more insight in sort of the roadmap. I don't remember if that was presented at the retreat, to be honest, but sort of how we're thinking about fixing this thing, like obviously improving the issue queues, but there's also other things. And, um, you know, getting, getting a little bit more insight in in the in the thinking there could be could be more meaningful to me than resetting the the numbers. Hello? The metrics. Hey Donna. Oh I'm here. Hello. Thank you. Okay. Uh yeah, Dries, I think that um to just to address your point, you know, last year as we put together the leadership plan, it lacked any kind of detail about what would happen on Drupal.org to drive some of these changes um, because, uh, you know, no CTO. <laughs> um, but, um, but to your point, yes, our next leadership plan and budget presentation should have more detail about the, um, the work that the tech team and community will undertake together on Drupal.org and how those affect those, the, the, the KPIs that are outlined for Drupal.org. Yeah. And it would be helpful because it's definitely a concern. Yeah, for sure. Oh. Anything else on these? Um, can I go back to a couple of points that I couldn't raise because I was on mute? Um, one about the slider, and I just wanted to state that one of the reasons we did that was to acknowledge that whilst our membership fee is trivial for for those of us in rich Western nations, it's substantial for other parts of the world. That's one. And the other one was a question around DrupalCon North America was, um, are we are we any closer to be able to announce dates for Los Angeles? Uh, okay, so on the slider, yes, that was one of the reasons we did that with the slider. Unfortunately, the result is that um, it is mostly North Americans who are, <laughs> I mean, American Americans um, who are dragging that slider down. <laughs> so, well, I think I feel like it's a, you know, something I want to be sensitive to that, um, but it's, I don't think it's really it's not serving that purpose. I, I I understand that. So I think that I just think that that needs to, you know, I felt that it just needed to be stated. It wasn't just like, oh, it was some crazy experiment. Oh yeah, and no. Just abandon that, rather than you know, actually there was a reason for this, and the reason is this, and I feel that that should be stated. Yeah, I think any way that we reconfigure it will still involve a way for people to pay less based on, you know, what I mean, so that anyone can choose to give what's right for them. The, the slider mechanism cool. just may not be the right way. Um, and then the second question was, are we closer to? Um, yes. Yeah, so we. Um, <laughs> So we should have um, our a final contract in our hands very shortly. Um, so we've been going back and forth with the LA folks, you know, finalizing things. And the reason we just haven't announced dates is because we don't want to do that until the ink is dry on the contract, right? Yeah. Um, uh, no, so. I, I understand the reason. I just wanted to get a bit of an ETA because I've had a few people going, when is that? And so. Yeah, I have too, actually. Yeah, I get that. And I, yes, I understand that. I am as so concerned as you are. Soon, soon is the answer. Soon. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's what I've been, that's what I've been saying. I I, I want to say that uh, at my last uh, the last meetup that I went to, I was sort of hijacked by about fifteen people around <laughs> that. Okay. So. Do we have a month? May. Yes, May. May. Okay, great. Which I understand is fall and not just spring. What? For Donna. Oh. <laughs> Got it. No, aut autumn we call it. Oh, sorry, autumn. That's very that's much <laughs> lovelier. That's much lovelier. Um, Thanks, Holly. That's useful. Okay. All right. So then at DrupalCon C.0, um, you know, I think um, I think the, the rest of the things um, to talk about um, in here, sorry to scroll so quickly through this if you're looking online. Um, 
the job board, um, we announced at TripleCon Austin. We've been able to start showing some folks different pieces of it. I think um, we're working on getting the final features in place and getting that out the door in the next couple of weeks. Um, and um, it's definitely later than we um, anticipated, but not, you know, um, not crazy, uh, crazy off schedule. Um, so we are... We're looking forward to getting that out there and we'll see, you know, we'll see how that impacts um, revenue. Um, I've got some adjusted numbers for you in the budget discussion later. Um, so, so the job board, we're excited to get that online. Um, and then I just want to, one more word, um, I already said some words about membership, but just again, just congratulate Joe um, and Liz um, for getting us above 3000 for the first time this year. Um, and that certificate campaign that they ran um, during DrupalCon and, and afterwards um, did really well. They had um, a goal which they exceeded um, for the uh, for, for memberships and renewals, which was or purchases and renewals, which was 600. Um, so that was really great. And again, I'm just really excited to see them experimenting and building numbers to track against, um, you know, for future campaigns. So those are my highlights with all the words. There are some other numbers in there. So if you have questions about other areas of the update, I'd be happy to field those as well. All right. Did, did you mean that these were your highlights, about, you know, in general or just this section? No, in general. Sorry. I'm all done is what I meant. <laughs> I thought there was a couple of other sections. Yeah, there's a couple, a couple of other sections, but... Um, all right. If there's no questions, I think we can move on to the uh, updates from the, the board committees. All right. Let's get started with the revenue one. Oh, we'll do, we'll use the order in the that's in the overview table at the top. So I don't know who's presenting that. Revenue or finance? Oh, hang on. Revenue. 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 That's not Revenue. Uh, is Megan present? She's probably muted when she's. Sorry. Hang on. Yep, I am here. There we go. Yay, Yay Megan. Megan, do you want to be our spokesperson? Do you want me to say anything? Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, sure. Um, I'm sorry. Can you repeat their question? It was a little quiet. Uh, just an update oh. on revenue. Yeah, they're just looking for the regular uh, committee update. Sure, right. Um, uh, so what we've been doing, uh, we left DrupalCon Austin for the first time. We walked out of DrupalCon Austin with so much pre-sales, which is great for 2015. So we are already almost at half a million um, in terms of DrupalCon LA and a great pipeline for Latin America. So. You know, taking Austin, using it as a platform for pre-sales, really worked well and and um, set us up for a lot of success in 2015. Of course, we're keeping our eye on the ball for 2014 as well. I've uh, been working with Holly in terms of where we are and where we think we're going to end up. And we've made some adjustments, um, things that I've, I've been communicating in the past. But just to recap, um, the technology supporter program just requires a lot more dedicated time and um a lot more of what we call hunting versus farming in sales. So in other words, a massive, much more heavier lift than we anticipated. And that would jeopardize um, some revenues. And so we did make a shift. We didn't, we're not shutting down this program, but we did just launch the hosting supporter program to compensate for the revenues. And um, this has been a very popular program out the gate, and we're already at 60% um, of goal there because uh, we were doing some pre-sales kind of when we were testing the concept. Um, we also are compensating that revenue by going over on the hosting listings on Drupal.org. And so far, uh, we're moving well in that direction. Um, we are testing out some new listings. Uh, we've been testing them for the last two months, and now we're ready to start selling those spots. Uh, we're really fortunate that we have uh, Philip. Um, I'm not going to say his last name correctly. Philip is our new content manager on staff, and he's going to be working with me to make sure um, our web advertising and our listings have better traffic so that we can um, start scaling up the revenue opportunities there. 
and uh, and so we're this pivot around the tech supporter program so far is looking very positive. Um, the other area that we're keeping an eye on in 2014 is the um, job board, and we're looking to uh, launch that in the next few weeks. Um, you know, trying to get out of July with that launch and. We did a lot of early promotion about this. Um, talked about it um, a lot, obviously, at the um, at DrupalCon Austin. So there's been some nice buzz, some good awareness. There's going to be a heck of a lot more um, coming out the gate with the marketing department uh, once this goes live. Um, and so we did adjust some numbers around the job board just because we are um, just compensating for the timing of the release, um, but we feel pretty strongly that the interest is there, uh, and uh, we're kind of all everything's like ready to go, so we can start marketing and selling that that product. Um, and uh, can't think of anything else other than DrupalCon Amsterdam is also looking very strong, um, especially from a sponsorship standpoint. And so we are at, as of yesterday, we're 99% of goal on sponsorship and still a pipeline and products um, to sell. So uh, we'll be using that additional sponsorship revenue to help um, offset any overages on the um, expense side. So we're just kind of watching the overall health of the DrupalCon Amsterdam um, profitability, um, and kind of pushing in all fronts to make sure that's going to be um, where we anticipated from a profit standpoint. Uh, so I think I've covered all the products. Do you have any questions? Do you want to just give them a quick update on what we talked about at Austin? I can't remember. Did we report back up for that? You did. Uh, that breakout of the committee? Okay. All right. We did. And just an update on, on that is um, I'm actually in the process of scoping out those different opportunities now and getting it out to, the, to you, Jeff, and the rest of the revenue committee. So that way... Um, I can make sure I captured all the ideas, flesh them out enough, and then we can start even testing them. So I, I definitely want, I'm starting to move on those concepts already. Yeah, okay, cool. Any questions on that? All right. Um, the next one is the governance uh, committee. Um, I guess I, I could uh, give a Quick update on that. Um, so we we had we have you know we met in Austin and we haven't met since. And actually we have a, a bigger session or section I guess later in this meeting around some of the changes uh, that came out of or proposed changes that came out of that meeting. So maybe we can skip skip over those for now and then circle back later. And finance, unless there's questions. Yep, um, so we haven't met either. Um, the May financials uh, were emailed around to the committee members on July 1st. We haven't seen June yet, as Holly mentioned. Um, we'll see those soon. Uh, we decided to not meet on July the 4th. Um, and uh, instead, uh, Holly and I are working, are going to work on a couple of policies that the committee is going to review um, at our August um, committee meeting. One of them is a succession plan for um, ED, and the other is an investment policy um, and foreign currency policy. So those are the, the two things we're working or I guess I'm going to be working on, and then the committee is going to be looking at in August. Otherwise, not much to report. Any questions? Is our, is our next meeting uh, on Friday? No. When is it? What our next meeting be? Yeah. Uh, in August. We decided to 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 skip oh, July. Oh, we're totally skipping the month. I knew we were skipping that day. I just didn't know. Yeah, we're skipping we're the skip month. It. Summer okay, break. So the, we need to look at these these statements then, or the sorry, the May statements. Yeah, and you'll yes. get you'll get June early next week. Okay. And we can review on August fifteenth at our next regularly scheduled finance committee meeting. Okay. Cool. All right, the uh, executive committee, we haven't met. Um, we have no updates. So that brings us to the marketing committee. Yeah, this is Joe Saylor. Uh, the, uh, unfortunately, the main update is that uh, our current marketing chair, Betsy Ensley, uh, has left her position at ThinkShout and is also vacating her 
uh, position as chair of the marketing committee. Um, oh. So we'll uh, we'll have to go back and um, try to identify a new uh, marketing committee chair. So I'll be working on that uh, uh, effective immediately. So um, she did have a few initiatives in progress, and I'll continue moving those forward. But uh, but Betsy has moved on. So uh, onward. We know she's in a better place, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think she's moving to the East Coast. But yeah. Beyond that, I'm not sure what her plans are. I think she's coming back to D.C. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, sorry, as the executive committee, while we didn't formally meet in a meeting, we did uh, email conversations around uh, the incident with Morton. And you know, I believe you guys are up to speed on that, and we, we can definitely talk more about that in the executive session. So that's a, uh, a correction, I guess, on my end. Um, all right, with that, I think we should move on to the, some updates around the board governance. Uh, we met at DrupalCon Austin, the governance committee, which is Matthew and Denise. Um, Amir wasn't there. Uh, and myself was there as well, and uh, Holly also participated. In so did meeting. Donna. I don't know who's going to present. Is it Matthew? Are you going to present? Yeah, I'll present. Donna, Donna uh, participated too. Which oh, was that's right. She did was she great as well. <laughs> Apologize. As election Donna. election A alumni. <laughs> yeah, it, it was super super good to have that uh, that context. So thank you very much for that. No worries. Uh, let's uh, let's go on to the uh, the uh, second slide. Actually, let's go through the second and on to the third slide if we could. We might. Hang on. Okay. Okay, so we talked about uh, community elected board seats, and uh, and uh, uh, part of part of the conversation around it really was um, fit. Um, and you know, one of the observations of the of the of the uh, of the committee is that we don't really have problems finding candidates. We usually have 13, 14, 15 people who appear to uh, be interested in running for the board, but the pool pool of individuals is largely untested. One of the things that we talked about was, uh, you know, the fact that in the last election, um, there were really only two recognizable recognizable uh, candidates, and and that that uh, that uh, that poses a, a, a uh, poses a, a challenge. There's often no significant track record around those uh, folks um, in terms of participation in the community. And there's little sense that the the candidates would be a good or a bad fit culturally. All of these um, are, are, are a bit of a risk. So we talked about pre-qualifying candidates a little bit. Right now, anybody can run. Um, anybody who, uh, in fact, I don't think that we even have rules around whether you're on D.O. Basically, anybody can get on, 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 uh, on the internet and jump onto one of those forms and self-nominate -nom themselves, um, regardless, regardless of, their, of their time with, uh, with community. Um, or not. So we started uh, exploring limiting those who could run with a simple rule. Um, to run, you must have shown a desire to serve by sitting on one of the public board committees. We feel like there's a lot of different committees that people could sit on and, uh, and participate with. That shouldn't be a huge, a huge barrier to those who are truly interested in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in making this kind of, this kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, Commitment to the to the association. Um, so let's go on to the next. The next. Can I just slide. speak to that particular issue, um, sure. Matthew? I, I I I was part of the conversation, but I do want to raise that um, participating in those committees have some barriers. Um, you have to know about them. You have to um, be in the right time zone, and you know, being part of it, it you sort of have to find your way. Onto the inside club to to participate. They're not they're not really super transparent. So I think if we're going to make that kind of rule, that we also need to put some effort into communicating that they exist and that that, that is a pathway. Um, otherwise, I think we're 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 in danger of becoming a you know of it being too much of a, an insiders club. That's that's uh, that point is very well taken. Yeah, I agree. All right, so. 
that's that's the first first uh, sort of uh, of thing that we'll we'll talk about in just a few minutes. The second thing was uh, the idea of expanding the number of community seats. We briefly discussed the possibility of increasing the number of uh, elected positions. Um, there are a few issues around that. Again, part of it is cultural. The number of fits that we could reasonably hope for, given uh, uh, hope for in a given election period, is one of those uh, one of those issues. Um, we know that uh, if we get the wrong person uh, elected to the board, that can be that could be uh, um, uh, challenging. Um, and uh, and uh, what that really means is that we need to actively recruit, uh, I think, folks to run for the for the uh, for the election. Um, we need to be thinking very hard, just like we do for for uh, appointed members. We need to be thinking very hard around around the kinds of people that we'd like to have run that would uh, that would fill fill uh, fill voids that we've got and also uh, that would fit within the within the uh, within the culture that I think we we have currently in the in the board um, if if an elected member doesn't fit well um, we we, uh, we can mitigate this uh, by a provisional period and I'll talk about the provisional period um, in just a few minutes and I think at this point we want to open this up for a discussion Around these two concepts, um, one um, having having a pre-qualification for community candidates, and number two, expanding the number of community seats. Um, this is Angie. I guess I totally understand all the reasons we want to do that, but to me, it's sort of um, this idea of pre-qualifying the candidate, especially by via a process of committees that we own it to me it sort of changes the nature of the goals of those community elected board seats which is basically giving control directly to the community over what the board does because the cynical yeah. way to view that is like why don't we just abandon community elected board seats and just appoint everyone because obviously not any random Yahoo can just show up to you know governance committee meetings right like they would have to like be approved by the existing governance committee to come on board. Exactly. Um, exactly. So my it's point. like we're it's just a roundabout approval mm -hmm. process at that point. Um, and then I think you've hit on all the challenges though, which is why I'm nervous to expand the number of community elected seats, because uh, like plus one to everything on slide like three, um, you know, and and it would just expand that again. I think. Actively recruiting fits to run. That's something we should be doing regardless of the number of seats. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah I, I would say I, I'm not in favor of pre-qualifying by sitting on a, a you know, committee that we have control over. That kind of annoyment process, I think, um, doesn't feel right. Um, doesn't feel like why we, we created those positions. I'm personally very comfortable with the two community representatives, particularly now that they have two-year terms and then they alternate each year. Um, I actually would like to see that play out before uh, making any adjustments to the number of, of community seats. Here, here. Hi there, this is Denise. So um, the pre-qualification by, well, let's say the community participation requirement um, works very well for Apache, as an example, um, it's effectively impossible to become an Apache board member without having done work in a project other than a single project that you care about, but broader work um, and the committees are functional. They do things like manage the incubator or manage infrastructure or, you know, they have, they have other, other uses and it's well understood that that's how you gain uh, visibility that leads to board participation and um, and there doesn't seem to be any geographical barrier to entry because I've seen plenty of people use that method from parts of the world that aren't North America even though you know North America is where everything's hosted so um, I have seen it work for what it's worth Denise, um, Denise is that, that's, is that that's broader than just having our board committee, you know, because I think this proposal is that it has to be a board committee and that's a very small, a very sort of narrow pre-qualifying criteria, whereas the Apache projects are, you know, are much, much more expansive, I would have thought. 
Yeah, Denise, could you clarify, is it just participation in one of the Apache like incubator projects as a developer, as a UX person, as a project manager, anything? Or is it specifically working with the Apache software? Function? No, that is not enough. That is, that is not enough. You have to have done some work with the foundation. So um, that's also how you gain membership, for what it's worth. Um, if any, I mean, they have you know, tens of thousands of developers working on a, on a single project and uh, some handful of developers working on more than one project and maybe even achieving leadership in that one project. But that's not considered a good measure of whether they're going to be an asset to the foundation and the larger movement. And so the things that are considered good measures of that are working on projects that are shared across all of the, all of the areas, like infrastructure or uh, legal is another one, or um, uh, at one time there was a liaison to everything that had to do with Sun and Java, that, that was one of them, um, because that spanned a whole area, right? So um, the, it's pretty clear, and they're not, they don't have the explicit these are board run project areas, more like these are areas that are common enough that people across the foundation will have experience of you in a leadership position and have a better idea of how you would fit in on the board, which is really what we're looking for. So it sounds to me like our real issue is surfacing, maybe also making it easier to participate. Yeah, I think so. The OSI is using this as well, by the way. Um, they, they've been doing open, open um, nominations because they were restocking, but now they're switching to you have to have served on one of our committees so that we have some idea of what you'd like to work with for the same reason that we want to do it. Yeah, I think the, the concern I have is that there's very few places where they could serve. I think marketing committee is one of them. A nominating committee is another, but, but even that I think we restrict to the advisory committee for the most part um, if they're not a board member. Um, and then uh, there's the there's the working groups. We charter three of them, but then there's a couple that are chartered by Dries directly. That's about it, and it's a lot of the the same usual suspects. Yeah. And I think I think we well, we have, we've noted that we had an opportunity, like we have an opportunity when we're ready to take advantage of it, to have more committees with people on them. And then once we have that established, I think it makes a lot of sense to. Um, to use that as the, the pool, just I think where we're at right now, I'm, I'm concerned about how it would so work very maybe, well. Maybe we need to decouple sort of how people can qualify and focus on the notion of, you know, we can think of other ways for people to qualify, whether it's helping with, you know, DrupalCon or something, you know, these are also things which could potentially work as mechanisms to qualify. Imagine a world where we have different ways, enough different ways to get people involved. Are we comfortable with the idea of, of pre-qualifying? Well, I think the whole idea is, it, I mean, I think the whole idea, again, is to set them up for success because um, we haven't had a ton of success in our program to include community seats, but obviously community seats are important. So um, we're, we're trying to come up with ways to make sure that those candidates have the best likelihood of, of being successful so that we minimize um, feelings, hard feelings when it doesn't work out. I guess, like, yeah, I think the pre-qualifying makes sense for, for a number of reasons. My problem is, like, let's say you do all that, right? Like, you pre-qualify, you do all the work to, you sat on the marketing committee for six months. But because you're on the marketing committee, none of the developers know who you are, and so they see you sitting up there against Morton, and they're going to vote for Morton. Um, you know what I mean? It seems like pre-qualifying is more something that we would do for our own. I think you have a lot of background going on. Thank you. Um, could you could you repeat that, Ange? I, I didn't hear half of what you said. Yeah, I mean, my, my only concern is that, like, judging by how community elections have gone, 
uh, and this is pretty much a general rule that I've extrapolated. Uh, whoever has the most Twitter followers wins every single time. So yep. Yep. my concern is that uh, when we pre-qualify people in this fashion, what we would probably end up with is either a situation where we have someone with a lot of Twitter followers and two other people with very little Twitter followers, especially if it's board committees, because these are going to be non-technical things like serving on the uh, marketing committee or whatever. The, you know, they're going to be doing all this work to pre-qualify for essentially no reason because they're never going to win an election. And then the second thing um, is that, ah, shoot, I had another point there. Doesn't matter. But, um, gosh darn it, I hate it when I do that. Um, <laughs> oh, I have no idea. Um, so, so Ange, I'm gonna I'm gonna counter that with a with a with a statement, a personal statement. Um, I put myself up um, both uh, when uh, when uh, the, uh, the association was a uh, a Belgian um, nonprofit, and also after the uh, the uh, um, association um, became a in a, a U.S. nonprofit, and I believe that I. I uh, I put myself into the into the into the fray five or six times. Um, I I think I think that there are uh, I think I think that if we're engaged in in uh, in some level of prequalification and we know they we know that there's uh, uh, x number of, uh, of 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 board seats. Let's say it's two for the time being, but maybe maybe in the future it's more than two. But let's say that it's two and they're staggered. And let's say that you're going up against a, a Morton one year who has tons of Twitter followers. You're not going to be going up against Morton the next year, right? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that I don't know that, that uh, I don't I'm not sure that that really should but I, I feel like I feel like I feel like that that that, that shouldn't be something that we, we, we decide is a, is, a, is a motivator against um, uh, figuring out whether somebody is going to be a good fit or not. Um, I think when we take a look at historically the, uh, the, the uh, community members who have come on, on onto the board, we've had, we've had mixed, really mixed, really mixed um, uh, uh, mixed. It's been a diverse crowd. Yeah, and 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 I and I and I and I personally, I'd love it if we're in a position where we know somebody is highly committed. They're going to work hard. They're going to be tired at the end of their at the at the end of their term. They worked, you know, they worked their 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 tails off to help help the association move its agenda forward. And it's something that they want to do. Um, I think that I, right. I, I'm not sure that a lot of people who run. Really understand what it is that they're what the what they're getting themselves into. Um, some people, I believe, um, do it out of out of uh, the idea that it would just be something fun to do, right? Um, so I don't know. I well, what I'm getting at, Matthew, is not anything about the candidates. I'm getting at the voting pool. The voting yeah. pool has no idea what the hell you did on the marketing committee because they don't care about the marketing committee. Yeah. Um, and so they're either going to vote for the person they know the best, or they're not going to vote because they see a bunch of people up there they don't know. Um, that's what I believe would happen. Um, and so I guess that's my concern with pre-qualifying for elected seats because the whole point of elected seats is it is a popularity contest. And, you know, you're either going to vote for the person you know, or you're going to vote for no one, I think, is what most people do. And then you have the problem where whoever sits in that seat for two years is decided not even by just the handful of people that decide it right now, but a micro handful where it's like literally like 20 votes might decide, you know, who wins. I don't know. And that's my concern anyway. I think pre-qualifying makes a lot of sense for people we're going to appoint for like our board, but the community elected just feels like a weird fit. But that's interesting to hear Denise say that it works well in Olakai and Apache, and those are elected seats as well. Yeah, all their seats are elected. So they're effectively all community seats. So in the interest of time, I think um, Matthew and the rest of the, the governance committee, I think you get some some useful feedback on that, I think. I don't know if you guys want to regroup about that and um, go back to, um, you know, maybe come back with a, a, a variant of the proposal or something. Um, 
but it, I think in the interest of time, we're an hour into this meeting, and we have to, yeah, um, you know, we have to we have to tackle a couple of other topics here, and then we'll switch to the executive session. Maybe we should take that input. Maybe we can take it offline and and come back with um, either the same proposal or a different proposal. Um, but I'll leave it up to you guys. Um, I would I would love to have a have a follow up meeting and and uh, and uh, uh, digest digest um, the pros and the cons that people brought forth. Yeah, this is some area I think that w works for me as well. Okay, so uh, the next uh, the next section really has to do with uh, again with uh, with fit. Um, we uh, the committee discussed having a provisional period where the where a board member is on uh, that is um, onboarded uh, would have a provisional period that would last a year, and after that period is complete, both the current sitting board and the new board member would evaluate if the fit is right. I think that uh, the the goal on that is to is to put us in a in a place um, where uh, where uh, um, there's an easy out um, if uh, if the fit doesn't feel right on either side of the uh, side of the uh, uh, fence, so to speak. Uh, and we'll talk about that. We'll we'll open that to, up to discussion in just a minute. Um, the second thing that we talked about was uh, was term limits. Uh, Many boards have term limits. These term limits are designed to do quite a few things. One, the biggest thing is to reduce bur burnout. Um, typically, if a, if a board member has been on a board for six to nine years, um, they are tired uh, if they've been, been doing their jobs effectively. However, there's often a sense of ownership. There's a sense of guilt if, you're, if, you, uh, if you say that you need a break. And it can be really difficult for a board member to give themselves the p permission to just take a break. Limiting terms sort of takes that out of their hands and uh, and uh, allows that uh, allows that uh, that uh, sort of recharging period to occur. Um, typically, in these cases, after a suitable time period has passed, veteran board members can cycle back onto the board. Um, the the idea here is that we can also promote positive turnover, so new ideas can infuse the organization. Um, what boards need in expertise is not static. It changes over time. Term limits allow for easy trans tr transition uh, for these kinds of things. Um, and uh, I think it's important to note that when a board member does rotate off, it doesn't mean that they're saying goodbye. Um, often, often boards will use these people in committees and auxiliary boards um, to keep that uh, expertise in place, but reduce the sort of general burden on, on that individual. Um, one other, one other uh, really good reason for limiting terms is to is to uh, spread institutional memory across many, many people, not just a few or worse, a single person. Uh, that institutional memory is really, really critical um, for the health of an organization. So, we propose that uh, we uh, we set limits at six consecutive years, with one year off between terms. Um, minimum year between terms. So somebody could sit for six years, uh, go uh, rotate off for, for a year, sit for another six years if they wanted. Um, so what we'd like to do is, uh, is open this up to discussion real quick and then if people feel like this is generally a, an okay idea, uh, vote to amend the bylaws. I'm probably not going to support voting on it today since we're not really going to get enough time to talk about it. But I do want to point out that um, there actually are already term limits in there. Um, if you have it in your slide, but folks who are listening in um, may not be able to see it. Yeah. It's four consecutive terms. And I think what um, I'd like to see incorporated in this, because we actually do have several people on the board who are filling partial terms, um, and that's not accounted for here. So usually you would say, you know, can they serve two three-year terms on their own and in addition to filling a year or two in a partial term or how does that actually play out? That's the reason why when we drafted it we put it at four was you know nobody in their right mind is going to serve four terms so we just left it and said okay this is the, the max amount of time that you could serve um, in the board but it, you know if you're going to go ahead and go this route which I'm not going to comment on um, I do think it needs to say the maximum number of years and account for partial terms. Um, I, I, do think, I do. I do think that it needs to account for partials, and um, and I think in our conversation of modeling the fact that 
there's a bunch of people coming up for election in a minute here. Um, and for instance, I just served a two-year term, and and so if the maximum is six, then I wouldn't be able to serve again. As as just a, needs to be part of the consideration. But there's an example of the partial term. Um, I think what we said was two complete terms for the sitting board, or in other words, who grandfather the board in whatever term the full whatever full term they're in now is a full term. There'll be one there'll be a little term now they'll get to have two full Oh. That's awful. That was the end of me. <laughs> I think Denise Oh here I was gonna restart my computer. Everybody else heard that too, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think what she was saying was that it that it needs to be changed so that it's two uh, full terms in addition to any amount of partial terms, so for no more than eight consecutive years. Is I think what she was saying, but I also heard robots. <laughs> yeah, I wrote down in a minute. <laughs> Yes, I, I think I think that what you should I, I think uh, I think that you, uh, Tiffany you you uh, you um, interpreted the robot and the and the white noise correctly. Do we want to do we want to have uh, additional additional conversation or do do we want to table this until the the next uh, next uh, next uh, uh, board meeting? Yeah, and I'm not. I'm also not clear with some of the wording. I need to give it some more thought about. Um, I think we need to clarify that terms um, commencing with the the first class of 2011. I think that wording seems a little confusing or awkward to me, because um, I think what you mean is in the newly reconstituted board. Then, yeah. Um, yeah. so starting with that first class, it was in 2011. That yeah. makes sense to me, the November 1st, 2011. So yeah. I probably put, um, you know, that date in there because we all started our terms at the same time then, although Dries, Angie, and I have terms that predated that. Right. And I think you're excluding those or if I'm reading this correctly. Mm-hmm. But I think there's some, some really good feedback. I think, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for others, but I personally think there's some good ideas in like forcing a one-year break, for example. Um, so maybe you guys can go to work on it a little bit more, and then we'll can talk about it more at the next meeting. Yeah, I think that that's uh, that's smart. Okay. Um, and then if you skip through the last, uh, the the next uh, uh, slide to the last uh, slide. Um, We've tried. We we. It was indicated in today's today's uh, today's uh, uh, meeting that we were going to have uh, uh, a three minute update for uh, activities for each committee. Um, clearly, the 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 second bullet sort of happened. The first bullet, I don't think, did happen. Um, so what we'd like to do is make sure that each committee meet at least once a month. Um, and uh, and uh, and I think that that probably ought to fall to the to the committee chair to uh, to organize um, and make sure that those meetings happen. Really? Because I'm not sure that like I'm not sure that governance needs to meet once a month for the whole year. Like I, I think I'm okay with setting some sort of minimum, but 12 meetings of of the governance committee or 12 meetings of the nominating committee. Like m a monthly meeting of the nominating committee, I'm not sure that's effective use of people's time, especially since nominating meets more frequently once it, uh, you know, once they're actually doing the nominations. I do think that there's value. Let me just uh, counter that for a second. One of the things that uh, came up in our in our uh, in our self evaluation is that we don't communicate. Um, and and uh, and it, it was uh, you know it was uh, 
indicated on multiple occasions, uh, rather by multiple people, that that uh, between board meetings, uh, uh, there there's very little communication with uh, some board members um, with uh, with uh, with the body at uh, at, uh, at large. I don't think the meeting needs to be very long. It can it could could, could literally be a Skype a Skype. Uh, chat or an IRC chat that says, hey, is there anything for us to discuss? And if it's no, then move on with your day. But I do think that not setting meetings um, is going to is going to set us up to not have meetings, period. Like, it, it, nothing will change. I personally don't like those kind of, you know, a meeting that's disrespectful of my time. You know, we all have are very, very busy, and so to have a meeting that I have to block on my calendar to then show up to the meeting and have there be no agenda, that that doesn't sit very well with me. So the agenda could be set out, sent out in advance that simply says, hey, is there anything that people need to talk about? And if they don't, then you don't have the meeting. But the point is, we're not, we're not even doing that. Uh, this is Samir. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think you know the, the the frequency of the meeting should be set based on the task at hand rather than just having it set on a schedule um, because of this this, uh, this problem, which is okay. So we set a meeting every month and then we have nothing to do. Um, that said, of course, you know unless we have something to discuss, there's no point in having meetings. So I think we need to address that issue first, which is you know like for instance the nominating not nominating committee will not have. Uh, anything to do other than, you know, during the duration when we are looking for people. Uh, so I would rather have the agenda drive the schedule than the other way around. And I'm totally cool with that, but I do think that once a month we ought to be saying, is there are there any agenda items? Do we need to do we need to meet? Well, so for me, that, that just happened, right? We just had, this is a new part of a board meeting, and apparently it's going to be a standing part of the board meeting, that every month there's going to be a three-minute update from each committee. And I think that's the point at which the rest of the board could say, hey, nominating committee, it's August, we should probably get on elections. And they go, oh, you're right. And then and then the next month they will have something to talk about, and they will meet monthly. Mm -hmm. but, and I think that's perfectly reasonable. Okay. So that to me is the first of or the second of those, but not the first. So the meet once per month is we're all going to meet once per month. The people who are on committees are going to give an update, if any. Um, and if there's more that needs to be done there, the rest of the board has the opportunity at the public board meeting to raise it, basically. And then we get to what Shamir said, which is you know like have the agenda drive the schedule. It sounds like there's not, because of the nature of the committees, there isn't a hard and fast rule, Matthew. So I, I think that the, the overall goal is um, meet, meet regularly um, and appropriately, um, but it doesn't necessarily make sense for them all to, have to, to meet monthly, especially if they have that um, board check-in, as, as um, Angie has just, has just noted. So I think we have to find a middle ground on this one. All right. Cool. Um, same thing as with the other points, I think. You know, good feedback. Let's think about it. Uh, and, you know, let's see what the government committee comes back with. Uh, any other topics any of you want to raise bef uh, before we move to the executive session? All right, well, thank you for um, this meeting. Thanks for attending. Uh, thanks for uh, working on this as well, Matthew, and the rest of the, the governance committee. Uh, let's uh, regroup on the other line for the executive session. Thank you.